Father, as we come to your word this morning, we are thankful, so thankful for all the blessings that we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask now that you just bless our time in the word and this message as we uh, honor and treasure God together, one of our ministry priorities here at the church, and uh, just bless us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I don't know about you, but I think turkey gets overemphasized at Thanksgiving, so I'm going to tell you a chicken story today. There was a chicken that needed to cross the road for his friend. And you're supposed to ask me, why did the chicken cross the road? It's an old joke. Well, the chicken needed to cross the road to go to the library. And when the chicken crossed the road safely, he got to the library and the chicken was overwhelmed as it got into the great room with all the books. And the chicken just started saying, Wow, 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 wow. The librarian said, shh, quiet down, chicken. What do you want? Chicken thought for a moment and said, book, 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 book. Librarian said, took, took the chicken over to a number of the best sellers and, uh, offered the chicken the book, and the chicken put the book under its right wing and headed out across the road back to the farm and down to the pond where its friend was, the frog. The chicken gave him the book, and the frog looked at it and just said, read it. <laughs> I don't know how many of you have heard that joke, okay? But it's an old one but a good one, right? And, and, and sometimes we maybe have heard things before, but I want to remind you and challenge us all as a church, especially in these next few messages that we have about our mission and our vision. See, Oxford Baptist exists to glorify God by making disciples who love one another and share Jesus with the world. A number of years ago, when I first came here, we, we walked through that. We wanted to establish what our mission and vision was as a church. And as I said, since 1890, this church has been going on, and, and it's been doing a number of things, uh, seeing leaders and seeing people come to Christ, built up in their faith, and, and then people are dispersed throughout the world, and, and it's an amazing, amazing thing. We want to be winning the lost. That's what Jesus did. He built believers. He equipped workers. He multiplied leaders. That was Jesus' ministry. But this morning, I want us to understand something very clearly, that one of our great priorities is to honor and treasure God together. But we need to ask ourselves some questions. What do you treasure most in your life? I mean, I'm always amazed at these people, and you see sometimes the, the video clip online, and they're out fishing with a big magnet in a river. And usually in some cities, it's amazing what they pull out. Sometimes they're pulling out guns. They call the police immediately. The police take the gun in. It's a kind of a treasure. And they find out that this gun has been used in a crime multiple times, but it's in the river. Or they, they've got one of those metal detectors and they're going on the beach, right? And you see these guys with, with their heads down and then all of a sudden it goes off and they find another tin can. Or sometimes they find a ring. Or they find something else. They find a coin. Or these guys who go caving. They're looking for treasure. They will go to just an amazing amount of energy to get down into these caves to find things. And it's amazing in Europe how many times they just find munitions from the First and the Second World War hidden in caves. Maybe not so great a treasure, right? But we're looking for treasure. We might try to find treasure in some other way. It might be sports. It might be a hobby. It might be the, the collections that we have. 
These are our treasures. But when we do not have Jesus Christ as our treasure, it's very easy in this life to start pursuing other treasures that basically build apathy in our life to even avoiding God. So instead of faith in Jesus Christ, we put these other things in that place. There are those two that have basically are living in fear. And they've chosen fear over faith. And as a result of that, fear gets upon us. And God gives us faith because he loves us by his Holy Spirit. Faith comes with a demonic, or fear comes rather, with a demonic spirit. Faith comes with the Holy Spirit. Everything that God creates for us is his gift. Just the other day, I, you know, it had rained, and then I was just walking barefoot on the grass. How, how many of you like doing that? Okay, not too many. Some of you need to do it more. But there's just something about that for me. I don't know. Brings me back to my childhood and running around the farm just in bare feet, right? Nowadays, they call it grounding or something. We didn't say that. It was just we're running around in bare feet and just enjoying the things of God. So many times I think we get caught up in what's happening on the news and all these other things that we forget about all the big gifts and the little gifts of what God has given to us. And these things online and on the, the media basically are there to help us, basically assist us and even move us to operate in fear rather than faith. God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but a power, love, and self-control or self-discipline, 2 Timothy 1.7. When you're fearful and timid, you know that's not from the Lord. Power that comes from the Holy Spirit is God's love for us. God's Spirit gives us the fruit of the Holy Spirit so that we can experience His best in our lives. And not fear, but faith. Greed is also another thing. Greed, actually, the, there's a great problem of greed within our culture. I mean, greed shows us our treasure is in the wrong place. And Jesus says in Luke 12, 15, he says to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. It's like in our culture, those basically are running by, well, whoever has the most toys at the end of life wins. Possessions never give us a win. We just have to fix them all the time. And God says that greed's a problem. In 1 Corinthians 5, verse 11, I mean, as, as Paul lays out this in a number of passages about greed, it's a very interesting study. Because greed takes away from us giving thanks to God. It makes us basically hone in on what we have that satisfies our soul rather than the God who satisfies our soul. I think it was uh, Corey Ten Boom who, of course, was in a concentration camp in um, this, during the Second World War with her sister. Her sister died there. She survived. I remember hearing her speak live one time, a strong Christian woman. Her and her family had Jewish people in their home. And she said, what I've learned in this life is that I have to hold things loosely. And Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 5 and Ephesians 5, Verse 5, he says, For all of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of God and in Christ. It's kind of like Gollum in Lord of the Rings. Remember Gollum? As, as they progress through, he becomes so greedy over a ring that he calls my precious Remember what, how he was like? The more he progressed, the more he wasted away. My precious. Very demonic voice, really. And it's easy to get caught up in that, right? 
rather than being generous, rather than being pray, giving God praise in all that we do. I mean, God has blessed us as a church. At times, we, we have difficult things that are going on, right? We have needs within our congregation. I was with a couple this week, their son, who's not with them right now, because of some circumstances, they need some help through our benevolent fund over the next, likely next month. They are now raising three teenagers and they're in their 80s. Can you imagine that? Imagine that. And so that's why we have a benevolent fund. You can give to that. Because there are times as pastoral staff, we know about things that are going on that no one else knows about. And, and that, that we can help people out. That's why we have a, a general fund. You, you help us. Those of you who are so grateful and thankful in your giving, you support a number of families, not only on our staff, but also missionaries around the world and other ministries as well. Because we want to minister both locally and globally as a church. We want to honor and treasure God because God has done so much in our lives. So we, do know, we want to be a church that blesses people. And as a church, our theme has been to grow more or be a community of great faith. And this faith moves us into this relationship with Jesus Christ that changes everything. And so when we went through this exercise, I took the leaders back, I guess, you know, eight years ago through one of the key components of a healthy church's worship and prayer. And we want to honor God by seeking and treasuring him together. That's what the early church did in Acts chapter 2. And through our series in Acts, we saw them over and over again just honoring and praising God and seeking him together because he is the greatest treasure. See, when Jesus Christ, or when the Lord is first in our lives, we have all the treasure we need. We have all the treasure we need. Jesus says in Matthew 6, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. But notice the first part of the verse. In order for us to experience the blessing and guidance of God and the help of God through difficult times, we need to seek his kingdom and his righteousness. Why? Because it's his kingdom that is the eternal kingdom. Nations come and go. I mean, if you look at a map of the world and look back through the centuries, how many borders have changed? It's amazing. Nations come and go. Kings come and go. But Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. See, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. So what is your treasure? Let's go to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13 has two very quick parables and two verses. These are the parables of the kingdom. They're amazing parables. We have studied them together as a church, but I, I believe that sometimes we, we need to re be reminded of these parables, these stories that Jesus tells about the kingdom of God. Verse 44 says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. And when a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. The parables of the kingdom in Matthew 13 are the sower, the good news of the gospel, will we'll continue to spread, but it will also be rejected by people. The wheat and the tares is there as well. People with genuine faith and people with a false profession of faith exist together between Christ's two advents. Then there's the mustard seed parable. Uh, believers and unbelievers will grow rapidly, and believers will grow rapidly from a small beginning. And the church continues to grow throughout the world. 
the yeast, people who profess to belong to God, will grow in numbers without being stopped. The hidden treasure and the pearl, but then it concludes with the net. Angels will separate the wicked from the righteous when Christ comes. There is going to be a judgment. There's a judgment for believers, which is the Bema seat judgment that we find in Corinthians. And then there's a great white throne judgment in Revelation, the final judgment, where everyone who has rejected Jesus Christ and the gospel will stand before God. There's an amazing message about that online that I just listened to last week in my trouble on Sunday after watching our service on Sunday. And I'm just so thankful to our staff team for Tyler. I call him at 9 o'clock. I said, I won't be preaching this morning. You are. I voluntold him, I guess you might say. Did an amazing job. And you know, that message fit better last week than this one that I was going to preach because this one needed some adjustments. The amazing thing about this, the, these two quick parables is this. First of all, we can be surprised by the greatest treasure. I mean, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. This man finds it. He hid it again, and then his joy went, and he sold all he had to buy, buy the field. He does not, it's not that he bought salvation. It's nothing like that at all. He discovers the, the treasure and buys the field in order to have the treasure for himself. Since the Lord did not interpret this, this parable, a variety of interpretive views are held. In the flow of this chapter, it seems best to understand it to be a reference to Israel, God's most treasured possession, and that God himself sent his son to pay the price for the greatest treasure, which is our salvation through Jesus Christ. In the Jewish background of this story, when you were out in somebody's field and you found the treasure, the treasure was yours. If no one claimed it, the treasure was yours. And Jesus comes into the world to redeem Israel, the people of God. Jewish and Gentile people, we all fit into those two categories. And Jesus comes and purchases the treasure for us. Searching for the greatest treasure is the next thing. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away, sold everything he had, and bought it. The parable, once again, is not interpreted by the Lord, but it's linked with the previous one. The pearl of great value may represent the church, the bride of Jesus Christ. Pearls are uniquely formed, and their formation occurs because of irritation in the tender side of an oyster. But there's a sense in which the church was formed out of the wounds of Jesus Christ, and Christ has made it possible by his death and his sacrifice for us to have, be that treasure. And so this merchant sells everything he had in order to buy the highly valued pearl. And it represents Jesus Christ through his death. He provided redemption for us, for those who would believe. And these two parables are in close proximity, the treasure and the pearl. They, they teach that within a period of time when the king is absent, Israel would continue to exist and the church would be growing, made up of Jewish and Gentile people, one church through Jesus Christ. Here we see the surrender. See, when you understand that Jesus Christ and his gospel is the greatest treasure, you'll surrender for the greatest treasure. Deuteronomy 6 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength. It's repeated again in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So the last question I have for you this morning is this. Why should the Lord Jesus Christ be our greatest treasure? And you might be younger here or older here. I remember visiting a pastoral friend of mine in southern Manitoba in a small town. We had a pastoral meeting in the morning, and he said, hey, can you stay around for the afternoon just for a little while? And I thought I drove two hours here. I might as well just spend some time with him. He says, I want to take you to a house. 
So in this small town, there's a really huge house. He says, uh, we can't go in. I said, well, why not? Because the owner has been collecting things for decades. He is so scared that somebody's going to steal it all that he walks around in there each day with a revolver to protect it all. He's basically hoarded antiques to such an extreme that he lives in this kind of fear. My friend went and actually knocked on the door and said, uh, how are you doing today? Do you need anything? He says, no, my, uh, my weekly groceries will be delivered very soon. Living in fear because of stuff. Treasures that will not amount to much in, in eternity at all, but missing the greatest treasure of all. Jesus is to be our greatest treasure because he is our creator. He is the sustainer of all things, as we see in Colossians chapter 1. You're here today because God created you. You are not a mistake. You are part of his eternal plan. And all of us who know Christ understand this, that we are his most treasured possession. We who are his people, the church of the living Lord Jesus Christ. And he created us as this greatest treasure. Male and female, he created them. Genesis 1. Deuteronomy 7, verse 6, and Malachi 3, 17, talks about that God's people are his greatest treasure on the earth. Did you know that? But that's what you are. It's not what you have in your home or what you don't have in your home or what kind of car you buy or how much you have in the bank account. It's all about what Jesus Christ has done for you. He is the greatest treasure. And Jesus is the only way of salvation, as we see in John 14, 6, where he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes unto the Father except through me. You might say, well, Jesus says something very dogmatic. It's kind of narrow. Well, the way to God is narrow, and the way to God is through Jesus Christ alone. You cannot save yourself, so give up on that. No religious ritual will save you. It is through Jesus Christ alone that you can have this incredible relationship and have this treasure that is an eternal treasure, not something that will rot in a box in a hole. Jesus Christ created us to be his greatest treasure. Online recently, a number of people have been just posting things that, uh, things about Jesus. And, uh, the caption is, things Jesus didn't say. Have you seen that one? It kind of goes like this. Did Jesus say, follow your heart? No, Jesus said, follow me. Did Jesus say, be true to yourself? Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Taking up our cross is identifying every day, every moment of our life with Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. It's not being true to yourself. Or the third one is believe in yourself. Did Jesus say that? Believe in yourself. Or maybe another phrase that goes along with that is you do you. Heard that one? You do you. No, Jesus said believe in me. Believe in me. Or I like this other one that the world says all the time, live your truth. There's a lot of people not living truth today. They got some ideas, they have some opinions, but they're just opinions, they're not the truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. In fact, he goes on even further. He says, those on the side of truth, listen to me, John 18, 37. My sheep, listen to my voice. I know, know them, and they follow me. That's what Jesus says. So how can we learn to honor and treasure God? We learn how to honor and treasure God, first of all, by surrendering our life to Jesus Christ. It's not kind of having one kind of standing, you know, you're trying to stand in the world and, and stand in the church and another one. All you do is you're basically trying to sit on a fence. Have you ever tried to sit on a fence? One leg on one side, one leg on the other. There's a lot of pain in that. There's more pain in that. 
You've got to surrender to what side you're on. Jesus said, you're either for me or against me, he said. And so we have to understand what the Word of God says in order to honor and treasure Him. We need to be people who are worshipers, not only coming together uh, as, we, as we do as a church to worship and praise Him through songs and prayer and the Word of God and our response to the Word of God when we hear it. We need to be worshipers throughout the week in our work, our attitudes, how we serve our fellowship with one another, how we pray and, and, and give our time, our talents, and our treasure in such a way that God gets the glory. When I was a little boy, my grandmother would often say, uh, Robin, I know my purpose. And she said it a number of times before I got it because she wanted me to ask a question. Grandma, what's your purpose? She says, my purpose is to glorify God with my whole life. And then she quoted 1 Corinthians 10, 31, no matter what you do, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And right there, it made real sense that my life was to glorify and honor God because he's the greatest treasure in my life. And then she said, when you are glorifying God because you know Jesus Christ, he wants you to become more and more like him, to grow in him, to be more and more like him, transferred or transformed into Christ by his Holy Spirit. And that as we grow in our walk with God, we become more and more like him. And then she said, then... God wants you to influence others around you so that they will come to know Jesus. Well, you have to live for him because everybody sees the fakers. But those who are genuine in Christ honor and treasure God. Honor God by giving him thanks. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. So let's be a people that are honoring God by seeking and treasuring Him together in all things. Don't try to live on the fence. You're either for Him or against Him. Your life shows it, and it's not an hour on a Sunday. It's all week that God wants us to live for him, and as a result of that, seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness, he adds all of these blessings into our life, even through the most difficult of times. I had a visit yesterday with a woman in the hospital going through a lot of pain. And she said to me, Robin, I, I just don't know. This pain is incredible, what's going on in my life. I said, so we need to pray about it. And uh, she just kept saying, you know, Robin, I, I love the Lord Jesus Christ. He's transformed my life. She came to Christ when she was 14 years old. Now she's older, let's just say. <laughs> but I said, you know what? No matter what we're going through, when we trust God, he gives us strength to face whatever we're going through. And we had a long discussion about Romans chapter 8 yesterday. And we prayed together. Sometimes God uses us to minister to somebody like that. But after I left, to be honest, I felt more ministered to than likely she felt from me. Because God gives us these opportunities to honor and treasure him with each other as well. Father, as we pray today, we thank you for your incredible love for us. Lord, our response is to you, for you to be the greatest treasure in our life. Father, you know each one of us here this morning, whether we're younger or older. You know the struggles we go through. And, and you know the things, Lord, that you are just maybe speaking to us about today. Maybe we've been living in fear rather than trusting you by faith. Maybe we've been holding on to things so tightly where greed runs our life rather than generosity and blessing. Father, you know the things. Lord, maybe we've forgotten that we are to honor and treasure you and you alone. 
As a result of that, our life is confusing. We're making wrong decisions. We are seeing the consequences of that. And Lord, I pray that you would just move in our hearts today. Help us to repent. Turn to you by faith. Deal with whatever is hindering our life with you so that we can just respond in worship and in praise this morning because you are our good, good father. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.